Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. And you can support the show on a one-time basis at support.greatdetectives.net. And I want to thank Jennifer and Walter for supporting the program that way. You can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month by going to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it is time for this week's episode of Dangerous Assignment. And the original air date, April 15th, 1953, and the title is Find Lenny Fenway. Dangerous Assignment, transcribed starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though, trouble, but... When I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize that this assignment's going to wind up with my life getting saved because somebody drops a bomb on me. Morning, Commissioner. You sent for me? Steve, the Flying Fenways are in trouble. The Flying Fenways sounds like a trapeze act. Frank and Lenny Fenway, ex-American Army flyers. They settled down in India after the war and opened up an airline. One of them, Lenny, disappeared in Tibet two weeks ago with the company's only plane. They are in trouble. Go on, Commissioner. He was carrying a passenger at the time, a Chinese nationalist agent named Tai Singh. The agent had been sent from Formosa to contact certain tribes in Tibet. Resistance groups still holding out against the new order in China. You know, if somebody could organize them, they'd be a lot of help to Chiang Kai-shek. That why the agent was sent? That's right. The nationalists also plant airdrops there to supply the tribes with arms and ammunition and other equipment. And you say Fenway flew the agent to Tibet and hasn't been heard of since? Any word from Tai Singh? Yes, a caravan from Tibet picked him up two days ago and brought him into Kashmir last night, more dead than alive. He's in a coma at the hospital in Sringagar. Hasn't been able to tell us what happened to Fenway. Oh, look, Commissioner, if he'd been captured, we'd have heard a propaganda broadcast about it. Yes, they'd certainly have accused Fenway of being an American spy and made a big thing out of it. Get over there, Steve. See what information you can get out of the agent Tai Singh... Find Lenny Fenway and get him out of Tibet before he falls into the wrong hands. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. The National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, colorful two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you will find Steve Mitchell on another dangerous assignment. Magnificent musical entertainment is yours for the dialing every Monday evening on the NBC radio network. Listen on most NBC stations to these great programs. The Railroad Hour with singing star Gordon McRae and guest artists from Musicdom's Hall of Fame. The Voice of Firestone, featuring Hard Barlow and the Firestone Orchestra and Chorus in the melodies you enjoy hearing. The Telephone Hour with the music of Donald Voorhees and the Bell Symphonic Orchestra. And, of course, the Dinah Shore Show, NBC's new Monday night program special starring America's favorite songbird, 
Miss Dinah Shore. Yes, every Monday night, listen to the best musical entertainment on this NBC station. Sure, I've got my assignment. All I have to do is find an ex-U.S. Army flyer named Lenny Fenway who disappeared in Tibet. Sounds like a cinch. Yeah, somewhere in China's backyard. Over 400,000 square miles of it. It's late Monday afternoon when my plane lands in Kashmir. I hustle over to the hospital hoping the nationalist agent, Tai Singh, has recovered consciousness and I can get a lead from him. But he hasn't. So I wander out to the waiting room. There I run into Frank Fenway, the missing flyer's brother. I told the colonel all I know about this. The colonel? Yeah, Colonel Yee. He flew in from Formosa this morning. He's with Nationalist Intelligence. He really gave me the old third degree. I think the guy suspects Lenny and I pulled some sort of a double cross. Why should he think that? Uh, beats me. This kid doesn't trust anybody. How'd you and your brother get involved with Tai Singh, anyway? Oh, he's an old friend of ours. We met him in China during the war. About a month ago, he walked into our office in New Delhi. He said he had a little business to toss our way if we were interested. And you were, huh? Well, he wanted us to fly him here to Syringar first and then over to a small village in Tibet. Why Syringar? I had to pick up some radio equipment he was to take with him to Tibet. That's how he's going to keep in touch with the shop here. What shop? Silversmith's place. It's a sort of a nationalist headquarters. Mm -hmm. This Colonel Yee you spoke to, where is he now? Oh, he's over at the shop, I guess. Why? I'd like to have a talk with him. Ten minutes later, we pull up in front of a small shop on a crowded side street. I show my credentials to the clerk, and he takes us to a small back room where we find Colonel Yee pacing the floor nervously. Nearby, a radio operator is fiddling with his set, but all he's getting is static. The possibility that we will hear from the missing flyer is remote, gentlemen. Still... Still, there's no harm in keeping an open circuit. What are your plans, Colonel Yee? Well, at the moment, Mr. Mitchell, my hands are tied. I could contact Formosa, tell them to begin the airdrop operation, but I... Wait a minute. How do you know where the stuff is to be dropped? Tysing was supposed to pick out the locations. You couldn't have talked with him. I did not have to. Here, look at this, Mr. Mitchell. Hey, a map. Where'd you get this? It was found in the lining of Tysing's coat. Wait a minute. These pencil marks, circles here, here. Hmm. Could they be the locations Tysing picked up? I think so, yes. But you can't be sure until Tysing regains consciousness and you've verified it with him, huh? And then your troubles are over? Oh, no, not quite. There is still your American flyer, Lenny Fenway, to be found. It is most important. To my government, yeah. Because if we don't find him, he'll be a perfect pigeon for some phony propaganda. But how does he affect your operation? He represents a very serious threat to the success of our mission. Oh, now, wait a minute, you. Take it easy, Frank. What are you driving at, Colonel? Uh, Mr. Fenway, your brother may know of this map. The locations where the airdrops are to be made. How could he know? First, let me inform you that your brother's plane has been found. What? When did this happen, Colonel? I learned of it only this morning when I questioned members of the caravan, the men who brought Tai Sing here. One of the men had heard from a villager at San Yitao that a plane was found abandoned near there ten days ago. Had it crashed? No, apparently engine trouble had developed. A forced landing was necessary. Oh, that's a relief. You must be still alive, then. You will not be happy to learn that the plane has been confiscated by hostile troops. I don't care about that. I'm more interested in Lenny. Yeah. And what makes you think he knows about this map? I am assuming that Mr. Fenway's brother accompanied Tai Sing on his journey to contact the various tribal chiefs. And being old friends, they might have discussed the location of the airdrops, huh? Well, I am assuming further that the two men were making their way back here when they ran into trouble. Soldiers, perhaps. Tai Sing got away. Perhaps your brother, Mr. Fenway, did not. So if Fenway was captured... The affair would be kept quiet while they put the pressure on him to try and make him talk. Exactly, Mr. Mitchell. Now, should my government go ahead with our plans, we might drop much-needed supplies and equipment into enemy hands. Yeah. So what happens now? Let's have a look at that map again, Colonel. Yes. Where'd the caravan pick up Tysing? Right here in the north, not far from the Xinjiang province border. Mm hmm Good place as any to start looking, don't you think, Colonel? Look, if you guys are going hunting for Lenny, you can count me in. Well, we'll need a plane to get us up there and... Oh, wait a minute. You're out of business, Frank, remember? No plane. I'm back in. I hocked everything I could get my hands on and made the down payment on another crate yesterday. I was planning on going out and look for Lenny on my own. All right. You've got a couple of customers. It's a deal. And this time, gents, the trip is on the house. <laughs> Mr. 
Shortly after nightfall, Colonel Yee and I board the plane. Frank Fenway guns it down the runway, and we're airborne, heading due east over the towering peaks of the Himalaya Range. There's a bright moon out, and it's going to make it easy for us to spot a place to land, but hard to do so unnoticed. About two hours later, we're approaching our destination, a long, narrow strip of plateau high in the mountains. Fenway makes a low pass over the area, circles, and comes in for a landing. The village is over in that direction, isn't it, Colonel? Uh, yes. We cannot see it from here, but it is not far away. I am certain we can contact members of the tribe there. Come on, Colonel. Let's get our gear ready. Yes. I'll pack the radio equipment. Can you manage the rest of the stuff? Okay, you guys, you're in. I'll get the door. Uh, get down. I'll hand this to you. Okay. Okay, let's have it. Here, here you are. Oh. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Now we're all set. Get up front and move this crate out of here on the double. Okay, Steve. Come on. We'll need it. You ready, Colonel? Ready. I have everything, I think. Yeah, let's head for the rocks over there. Right. Well, so far, so good, Colonel. Over here, Mr. Mitchell. Yeah, this looks like a good spot. We can keep under cover among these rocks here for a while and see if our landing has stirred up any interest. Oh, uh, in this moonlight, Mr. Mitchell, I do not think our arrival has gone unnoticed. How right you are, Colonel. Look, over there. What, what? Men on horseback? Yeah, a dozen of them at least, and they're headed this way. Uh, uh, quickly, let us move back. Yeah. What do you make of them, Colonel? I do not think they are tribesmen. No, I am certain they are not. Soldiers, a, a patrol. Oh, great. Here, behind this boulder. Hey, they're looking around. Probably figure the plane might have dumped something. Yes, I do not think they will come up here. You're right. They're moving on. They are headed for the village. Yeah, which means we'll have to change our plans. Oh, Yes. The tribesmen there will certainly be warned of the patrol's approach. They will move back into the mountains. We could attempt to signal them up there. Why not? Let's give it a whirl, Colonel. The Colonel and I drag out our flashlights and start blinking them towards the mountains. This goes on for half an hour, and then we get an answer. A slight blinking on and off in the distance. We pack our gear and head for it. The light doesn't seem to be more than a mile away, but distances are deceiving up here, and it's almost dawn before we arrive at the tribal chief's camp. We're given a tent, and while the colonel goes off to confer with the chief, I set up the radio. W6C32, calling Steve Mitchell. W6C32, calling Steve Mitchell. Steve Mitchell here. W6C32, that you, Fenway? Yeah. Steve, you alone? Sure, what's up? Did Tyson come too? You're in a jam. That Colonel Yi you're with is a phony. What? Police here in Syringa found the real Colonel Yi an hour ago. He'd been murdered. Oh, great. Look, Fenway, you'd better... Go on, Steve. What is it? Steve, can you hear me? What's wrong? Bloody what's wrong, wrong, Steve? But I don't think I can explain to Fenway, not with a cold the muzzle of an automatic at the back of my head. Then an arm reaches six, over my shoulder. Three, two, calling... Sorry, Mr. Mitchell. You came back just a little too soon, but... And now you find yourself in a rather awkward position. Do you not, Mr. Mitchell? You're not on too healthy ground yourself. What happens if the chief and his tribe find out that you're a phony? <laughs> there is no chief. And these men belong to no tribe. They are soldiers under my command. And you, Mr. Mitchell, are my prisoner. <laughs> Steve Mitchell will continue his dangerous assignment in just a moment. Last year, thousands of Americans who tried to get away with carelessness on the highways were killed or permanently injured in traffic accidents. Unless you're meticulous in your observance of the rules of highway safety, you and your family are vulnerable to the menace of traffic accidents. 
So heed the advice of America's professional truck drivers who are taught to drive ahead of themselves. Learn and obey traffic signals and signs. Every motorist should be alert and careful every moment behind the wheel. Don't think for a moment that accidents always happen to the other fellow. They can and may happen to you. And remember, folks, it doesn't take much effort to give hand signals, to dim lights, to look around carefully before driving out of a parking lot, or to slow up at intersections. Such acts of common courtesy can make the difference between accident trouble and safe motoring. So remember, observe traffic signals and signs. Drive ahead of yourself. Now back to Dangerous Assignment and Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yes, Mr. Mitchell. You are my prisoner. You're not in such a good spot yourself, ye, or whatever your name is. <laughs> and why not? Because the nationalist boys back in Kashmir know you're a phony. Oh, that is not important. What they do not know is that you are my prisoner. And when you broadcast to them at a time I will designate, they will be convinced that everything is in order. I see. I go on the air, but you write the script. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You see, my troops in this area are quite seriously short of supplies at present. We will gratefully accept anything our friends, the nationalists, care to donate by way of parachute drops, and you will, of course, give the signal over the radio for the drops to take place as scheduled. What? What is it? Machine gun. Yeah, it looks like trouble for you and your boys. What? Oh, it's a beautiful sound, isn't it? The phony colonel charges out of the tent through the entrance. I spot some natives on horseback with guns. The two guards are milling around trying for a shot, but one of them makes a target out of himself. I dive for the other one and flatten him. Suddenly a gent with a Tommy gun pops into the tent. Mitchell! Yeah, who are you? My name is Sam. I am tribal leader. Come! I don't need any urging. He hustles me outside and gives me a horse. His men are waiting about a dozen of them. We found the horse. The whole raid's been beautifully organized, and we're away without a scratch. Two hours later, we're winding up a mountain trail. One more hour to caves, which we use for headquarters. There you will find American pilot Fimway. Good. So you're one of the resistance leaders, huh, Sam? Yes. Each of us leader of our own tribe. I still haven't figured out how you knew I was being held prisoner. Fenway told us his brother might come look for him. We expect plane. Last night, we see plane land. Oh, so those men on horseback last night were your boys. Ye had me convinced that they were soldiers. My scouts follow you and find out what happened. Hold it. Airplane. Enemy plane. Yeah, coming in low. Going to make a pass at us. We're bottled up. No, those ledges over there. Riding under. Hey, God! He's coming in fast. We make it. I hope you're right. Hey, he'll probably turn and come back, and this ledge won't cover us from the other direction. By that time, we'd be around Bend and Trail. Come! We pound along the trail and around the bend before the plane can make its turn. We wind back farther and farther into the mountains. Half an hour later, we reach Sands headquarters, a cave near the ridge. There, I find the missing pilot, Lenny Fenway, with a bandage on his left arm. Steve, got it when we were ambushed. What happened, Lenny? Well, as you know, the nationalist agent, Tai Singh, hired me to fly him in from Kashmir so he could make the rounds of the tribal resistance leaders and line up locations for the parachute drops of supplies and ammo. Yeah. Well, we were on our way back when we had engine trouble. Forced landing. We abandoned the plane and started heading for the border on foot. Real rugged country. You run into a patrol? Oh, we sure did. I got separated from Tai Singh and got a slug in my arm. I wandered around lost a couple of days. Then San and his boys found me and brought me here. Is everything all set in the drops? What do you mean? Well, we're supposed to start Thursday. That's tomorrow. Yeah. Tai Singh told me it was very important to their whole timetable that the drops take place in schedule. Look, they can't. Why not? Because that phony Colonel Yi has Tai Singh's map. He knows the locations of the drops. His boys will be there waiting. He hasn't seen this map, though. Where'd you get that? Tai Singh gave it to me in case we got separated. These are the alternate locations for the drops. Tribal leaders know about them. Hey, if we can get this back across the border, the drops can take place on schedule tomorrow. There's only one hitch. It's a two-day trip on horseback. We've got no radio. Oh, great. Hey, what was that? Come on, let's get to the mouth of the cave. 
Hey, Sam, what's going on? Enemy plane have no chaos, dropping bombs. Oh, we don't have enough troubles as it is. We got to get bombed, too. Hey, look, way down the mountain, column of soldiers. Yes, coming to attack. We must leave. Hold it, let me have your binoculars. Yeah, there's a jeep bringing up in the rear. <laughs> what do you know? Our old friend Yi and the driver. Come, no time to lose. I'll say there's no time to lose. There's a small radio transmitter in that jeep, looks like. So? So we're going to cook up a little gag. If it works, we get the radio. What if it doesn't? Then we don't need the radio. I outline the deal to Sam in a hurry. He nods and takes off to give the orders. Lenny and I stay under cover in the cave. The troops and the jeep get closer. Suddenly, half of Sam's men take off along the trail in full view. The troops chase them, leaving the jeep unprotected. The rest of Sam's men come out of hiding and charge it. The burst hits a tire and stops the jeep. Ye and the driver pile out and dive for cover. Lenny and I run to the jeep, grab the transmitter, and bring it back to the cave. All set, Steve. Go ahead. Mitchell calling W6C32. Mitchell calling W6C32. W6C32. Go ahead, Mitchell. Your brother's here with me, Frank. You okay? Good. Got your plane standing by? Gassed up and waiting, Steve. Same spot? One hour after sunset. You got it? Be seeing you. Over and on. Sands boys will try to keep these troops diverted until we get to the rendezvous, right? Right. Let's go. Lenny and I slip down the trail and take off across the ridge, working our way to the plateau where the plane's to pick us up. We arrive in time to start a small fire to guide Frank. Steve, look. Coming around that mountain peak. Yeah, it's Frank. Right on schedule, too. Yeah, coming in for a landing. Come on. He'll stop just about opposite that clump of boulders. Yeah. Well, so far, so good, wouldn't we? What's the matter? Hey, look. Back there on the ridge in the moonlight. Troops? Yeah. Ye and his soldiers must have figured out the decoy. Oh, brother, to get this close to getting out of here and then... Come on. We're going to make a run for it. We run for the plane. The troops are getting closer. Looks like it's a dead heat. We reach the plane, yank open the door and dive in. Frank guns it off the ground just in time. Hold on to your hat for a tour. Oh, brother. That's a relief. Looks like we finally made it, Steve. Hey, Frank. I'm hit. Steve, you're closer. Grab the controls. I got him. Come on, baby. Come on. Straighten up and fly right. was close. How are you, Frank? I'll be okay. Just keep her pointed toward home. That's right. I'll get to deliver that map in time after all. Yeah. Hey, look, do me a favor, will you? Sure. What is it? Next time you guys take a charter flight and I have to fish you out of a hole like this. Yeah? Don't. Our star, Brian Donlevy, will return in just a moment. Variety is the spice of life, they say, and variety is what we at NBC attempt to give you each Thursday evening. Yes, each Thursday on most NBC stations, you'll hear such entertaining programs as The Roy Rogers Show, Father Knows Best, Truth or Consequences, The Judy Canova Show, and Eddie Cantor's Show Business Show. Roy Rogers brings Western song and adventure from the Double R Bar Ranch in Paradise Valley. Later, it's time for Father Knows Best with Robert Young in the title role. And perhaps you'll agree that the thing about which Father knows best is trouble. But trouble or not, there's always fun-filled listening when it's time for Robert Young to star on this station. Ralph Edwards brings you truth or consequences, and the action really begins when a contestant misses a question and has to pay the consequences. Judy Canova adds to the mirth and merriment with hilarious comedy and some songs in her own delightful style. Then Eddie Cantor brings you his show business show during which he reminisces about his years in the entertainment world. Every Thursday, listen to all these fine shows on most NBC stations. This is Brian Donlevy saying, 
Let's not forget to support the American Cancer Society. And be sure to listen to Steve Mitchell's Dangerous Assignment next week. Featured in tonight's cast were Stacey Harris, Sidney Miller, Paul Duboff, and Frank Gerstel. This is John Storm speaking. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell with Herb Butterfield as the commissioner, is written by Bob Reif and Adrian John Doe and is directed by Bill Carn. Be with us again next week at the same time when Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another transcribed Dangerous Assignment. Fridays, be sure to listen to Dinah Shore on NBC. Welcome back. Uh, This was a genuine Cold War thriller, and I think one of the more exciting ones we've heard. This is a series that can really amp up the adventure element when it wants, and certainly did so here. I do note that this is the second episode in recent weeks where we've had a major character from the enemy allowed in a position to harm the Western cause through some really poor identifications, thinking back to the Henrik Swandorf episode back in March. Don't like this plot point being used too much, and if this were as persistent a problem in real life, I don't think the Cold War would have turned out well at all, at least not for the U.S. Well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback, and we start with a note uh, that uh, Jennifer sent with her donation. Jennifer writes, Hi, Adam. Thanks again for the best old-time radio podcast around. Your selections, commentary, and obvious love of these great shows are appreciated, and I look forward to my daily downloads. Warm regards from Omaha. Thank you so much. And then I got a direct message from Patreon supporter Robert, who writes, Hey, Adam, just finished listening to the latest dangerous assignment, Rescue Rick Perez. My only question is why they sent Steve Mitchell to rescue the Hispanic agent in Venezuela. Obviously, he was going to stand out. They should have sent Mr. Chameleon in disguise. No high-speed car chase required. Keep up the good work. Uh, Well, thank you so much, uh, Robert. And I guess I would say that in their defense... Having a certain ethnic makeup was not going to be key to infiltrating the gang or getting their attention because the Australian guy, who sounds a lot more obviously not Hispanic than Steve, had no problem there. But it does raise an interesting point, and that is that chameleon skill set would actually make a whole lot more sense as an intelligence agent rather than a police officer. Hadn't thought of that, so thanks for that comment, Robert. And then we have a comment on YouTube regarding the episode Find Antonina from Maureen. Maureen writes, You can pick your friends, but your relatives are wished on you. Hmm, I've never heard that version of the saying. I've always heard it as... You can pick your friends, but you're stuck with your relatives. I wished on you I hadn't heard. And that makes it feel bad for Antonina, because who wished that uncle on her? All right, well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead and thank Damien. Damien's been one of our Patreon supporters since March of 2023, currently supporting the podcast at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Damien, and that will do it for today. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. If you're enjoying the podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. Join us back here next Tuesday for a previously uncirculated episode of The Thin Man. And next Wednesday, we'll be back with another episode of Dangerous Assignment. But join us back here tomorrow for Mr. Chameleon, where... I'm Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters.
Which one of you is Mr. Hamilton? I am Mr. Chameleon, Arnold Hamilton, and uh, this is my wife. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, the first question I have is, what is the name of the girl who met her death here tonight by going off the roof? That's the strange part of it, Mr. Chameleon. Strange, Mrs. Hamilton? None of us, that is, my husband and my son and myself, know who the girl was. You do not know? That's right, Mr. Chameleon. We have no idea who she was. Oh, yes, Mr. Chameleon, that's it. Several times tonight, my wife and I noticed a girl whom we knew we hadn't invited to our party. And we wondered how she'd gotten in. The next thing we heard, that dreadful scream as she jumped off the roof. She evidently got in here past the waiter at the door, deliberately to get to the roof's edge and commit suicide. She did not commit suicide. She was murdered. What? Somebody threw her off the roof, to the pavement, 18 stories below. That is what happened. Murder. Cold. Terrible. Murdered. Murdered? No, you can't be right, Mr. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.